Welcome to part 4 of my tutorial series about particle trails in Houdini. In this part I want to show you how you can render our setup using Redshift. So let's get started. As you can see here I added the second line into our setup and if we take a quick look at the line simulation you see that I also added some explanation here, some comments here and I just set up the second line that was already in the project before and added more or less exactly the same things as I did here. But I had to tweak a few values, of course, so that this looks nice. But you can go through this if you want. As I said, you can download the whole project file and also the HDA that I created in part number two on Patreon. The link is in the video description. Now let's take a look at how we can render this. So to render it, first of all, I want to split my paint top bottom because down here I want to put in my Redshift render view. So let's activate this. And if I activate the render view, right now you see that only my main lines are visible here because these are the only thing that are actually geometry here. The main lines, let me remind you, are uh, path deformed lines that I sweeped with a sweep node. So these are actual geometry. The other elements are particles and lines. So these are not visible by default. Let me turn off these things here. So let's take a look how we can make these visible. First of all, we can go to our small lines here and go to the Redshift object tab here. And under strands, you can then say render object as strand. As soon as you turn this on, you can choose whether it should be a box, then it is, uh, yeah, a box is wrapped around our lines. You can choose a cylinder, then they are round. You can use what's also cool, a strip then they are these flat strips. But in my case, I want to use a cylinder because this gives the best result, I think. And then of course you have this multiplier, this global scale multiplier. I don't know what is the standard value. Yeah, the standard value is one, which is of course way too thick. So let's set this down to 0 0.01, I think I had. No, that's too thin, 0 0.1. Yeah, that looks quite nice. You can play with this value on your own, maybe set it down a tiny bit, you know, that they are big thinner bit thinner, yeah, that looks good. And this way Redshift knows how to treat these lines. Now on the particles, we have to do something very similar. We have to go to the particles tab under Redshift object and say render objects as particles. And as soon as we do that, let's activate this. You see now they are visible here. And again, you have a global scale modifier that you can a multiplier that you can set up. Now it is time to create some materials. So let's go in here and let's create a material network. I prefer to do this right here in my object context instead of changing or moving to this material network here. It really doesn't matter where you create a material network in Houdini. You can do it nearly everywhere. So let's dive into this and let's create an RS material builder because as I said, I'm using Redshift to render this. So now let's create our first material and this will be my main lines material and let's dive inside our container here. I do not want to use the standard material. I could use the standard material. There is actually an emission option here but there is also this RS incandescent shader and this is actually made for emissive materials so I will use this. I prefer this one here. And we just have to link this up to the surface here. And now let's apply this material before I do anything else here. So let's go to my main lines and under render, I will just choose this material here and apply it. If I refresh my viewport, you see nothing changed because I didn't make any changes to the material. But if we come in now in here and change the color, then you see this will update. So let's choose a bluish purple here, maybe something like that. That could look quite nice. Okay. And for now, let's leave this as it is. So just the standard values. Now let's duplicate this one and call it my small lines. And let's also apply this material to my small lines geometry node. And that's also a reason why I like to separate these streams in the simulation and put them into these separate geometry nodes here because then it's a bit easier to assign materials. And 
yeah, I can turn off certain elements here individually. It's just a little bit easier and better to work with. Now let's use the small lines here. And if we activate this now, you see these are also purple. But now I want to use the color information that I actually created by assigning this curve view attribute here. And let me remind you that we did this with this color node here. And we used this ramp of attribute and we chose curve view here and ramped it from black to white. And I only use black to white to remap it now inside my shader. So I go in here and I put in now an RS point attribute first of all because this will read out the information of our color diffuse value. If I put this straight into the color then you will see that yeah you see nothing anymore because now they are mapping from black to white which is not really cool. But we can of course remap that so let's choose a ramp here and remap these colors. So let's create some more interesting colors. The first color will be maybe some a reddish pink here, something like that. Okay, then let's add in the second one. And here I want to move through to this purple here, maybe less, a little bit less saturated. Yeah, something like that, that could be cool. And down here I can go to something like, let's see, maybe turquoise or whatever something like that. And if we scroll through this now, let's see which colors we get. Yeah, that looks actually pretty nice. So this could be cool. So let's maybe decrease the saturation on this one a tiny bit. Yeah, that's nice. Another thing that we can do on the incandescent shader is to lower the um, alpha. And I want to do this here. So I want to, these to be a little bit transparent because then they will blend in a little bit nicer. For now this doesn't look spectacular as you can see but I will show you a few tricks later on in Redshift how you can make this really cool. So now with this setup we can just duplicate this material and use exactly the same setup for my particles because if you remember I assigned uh, random colors to my particles and I used a pop color node to do that. And I can use exactly the same setup to read out this color diffuse attribute from the particles and remap it with this ramp. So let's try it out. And let's move up here, go to the particles and under the render tab, assign this material, the particles material. And let's refresh this. And now you see we have all these particles and they have a lot of blue because my ramp is now, yeah, there's a lot of blue in there. So I can shift this maybe a bit. I move the purple a bit over that's quite nice. And also what I could do maybe here in the end, I want to have some brighter ones. So let's bring another color in here and let's just remove the saturation here, make it really bright so that we get some very bright particles in here, maybe a few more. Let's remap this a little bit, something like that. Okay. So let's take a look what we have here. And you see that right now it really looks pretty boring. So we should definitely add some post effects here because these make it way cooler. So let's take a look at these post effects options that we have. And one of the most important ones in this case is of course the depth of field. And if we take a look at the settings here, if you are familiar with the old Redshift versions, I think right now I am on Redshift. Let me quickly take a look version 3.5.14 and in the older versions there was a separate tab here for the bokeh. Now this is all included under optical here and that's why I want to show you this again. I know that I used these post effects in other tutorials already but some things changed and so I wanted to show the new settings a little bit. I didn't work through everything and I don't know exactly what they changed but I found out a few things. So first of all what I definitely want to do is add more exposure because this works quite nice with the bloom that I want to add la later. So let's set it to 1.5 for now, exposure plus 1.5. Now I want to change the aperture here. And if I go lower and lower with this, with this aperture to a really low value, now you see we get this very extreme depth of field here or this, this blurriness here. That's of course way too much. But in this case, I actually like it if it is a bit artificial and a bit too much. So let's take a look how this looks like. Yeah, it actually looks really cool because these particles look very nice when they are blurred. 
And then we can add some bloom. So let's go to the bloom tab here and let's lower the threshold until we start seeing something. And you see, we have to lower it quite a bit to zero actually to see anything here. And this has to do on the one hand, you can change this with the exposure as you can see here. But on the other hand, you can also change it in the material. So if we go to the small lines, for example, and here we have this intensity multiplier on our illumination. And if I set this to three, you see that these now glow way brighter. So this is actually way too much. So let's set this back to two. And I can also change the alpha. And yeah, this will also change the look of these. If I set it to 0.5, for example, they will blend into each other a bit more and will become a little bit, a little bit less bright. So that's a good option. Then we can also do this on the main line. And here we could go higher with the intensity multiplier. If we set this to three, then this line will glow way more. And let me do one more thing. I just want to take a color that is a little bit more outside of the colors of our small lines, because then it will be a bit more obvious that this is something else here. Maybe we do this really blue, bluish tint here. Yeah, that looks actually quite nice. And now let's take a look on the particles and want to set this also to two because then these become also way brighter. And you see right now the bloom is too strong. So let's go to the bloom settings and now we can just reduce this threshold. But you see now it's responding way nicer and we can really bring something in that's cool. And I don't want to overdo it with the bloom, you know. This is no bloom, so just a tiny bit most of the time is enough. And I think that this is already a very nice style. So if you take a look at that, that's really cool. And sometimes I really like to do that directly in Redshift and render it out just on a black plate. And then if you want to composite it, you can use the screen mode. I had some problems with this. I can render it out, of course, with a black background but I had huge problems rendering it out with an alpha channel because this just didn't work. And then you have a big problem with this depth of field things and applying a depth of field in post-production with these small lines, especially in After Effects, is nearly impossible. So what I usually really do is I set this up here and because these render quite fast, so if I activate this render, the, the bucket rendering, you will see how fast this is. And I'm rendering now only with one graphics card, so one of the... 3090s is active and the other one is recording or my 2080 is recording and you see it only took 10 seconds and that's really fast and you can even bring this down if you use denoising you can bring this down to a few seconds so let's take a look at that quickly because it's quite interesting to know let's go to my output context uh, let's turn it off for a moment and let's go to the render settings of Redshift and if we take a look here now, the threshold is quite low. So in this case, you do not need this. You can really render this with 0.1, turn on denoising, and that's it. You know, now you're good to go. And let's take a look how fast this will render now. So if we render with these settings, it will rush through, you know. We get even faster renders, and if you have multiple GPUs, then it will be really, really fast, and the quality is good, you know. If you take a look here, the denoising is doing a good job, of course, it's not that nice anymore. We lose some details here, but it really doesn't make a big difference. And yeah, okay, the render times are not that that much lower now anyway, so 10 seconds. But 10 seconds per frame in this resolution is really cool, I think. So this is really great for creating motion graphics. Good, so this is it with this tutorial. I hope that you learned some tips and tricks and actually it was a tutorial series. If you like my teaching style, then please check out Patreon. There I have some exclusive tutorials. And of course you can get all the project files and the HDA of this tutorial. So thank you very much for all of your support and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.